Okay, so um, similar to the talk before us, uh, we have two sets of requirements for building, functional and non-functional. For functional, we have to support a lot of different architectures and operating systems, so we have to support Windows, Mac, Linux. For architectures, we have to support x86, ARM, PowerPC, and S390X. I don't know, I'm curious how many other people in the audience have to support IBM, raise your hand. Just curious. Okay, one, up, one right over there. Love it. <clears throat> we have to support a few compilers as well. GCC, Clang, MSVC, Xcode. Uh, and we have a pretty big C++ binary. So it's 6.1 million lines of C and C++ code, including a bunch of vendored stuff. And this is uh, uh, calculated using CLOC, uh, which is an open source tool. And non-functional, we need it to be fast, and we need it to be correct. So I think it's very obvious. Uh, we chose SCONS for this. We're super, to be ex uh, super excited to be presenting at SCONSCON 2024 about uh, SCONS at MongoDB. Quick poll from the audience. Uh, who has heard of SCONS? Okay, yeah, I guess I should have guessed build conference. Okay, who is currently using SCONS? Whoa, okay, very exciting. Um, so this talk will definitely be for you two, but there's stuff for everybody here, I promise. Um, so to understand this talk, and, and we will talk about Bazel, I promise, and to get into that, we first have to understand a little bit of background about SCONS. So to understand SCONS, it is pure Python. There's no sandbox. It runs like actual Python code, uh, no Starlark, no nothing like that. You start with a, uh, a, a script that you'd run uh, that will set some paths to find the vendor code of SCONS, of your tools that you've written in Python, and then you hand over the controls to SCONS, and then SCONS will then call back into the Python code that you've written. And then we're gonna talk about uh, build files, I mean SCONS stripped files, um, which you may see have some uh, striking similarities. Uh, so there's two things I wanna highlight about these. There's libraries and programs. Does anyone spot a similarity to anything else? Um, so a library uh, can take in a couple header files, CPP files, and will build a, a shared archive or static archive. And then a program can take in several libraries, CPP, header files, and build an executable on Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever. Next we're gonna talk about a workspace file. I'm sorry, I mean the SCON script file, which is, uh, there's one of these, and it's at the root, uh, and this parses arguments. So for example, um, you might take in a debug flag and then you pass ndebug to your CPP uh, compile. And additionally, you'll set up some tools. These things hook into our SCONS build and do something special that make our build ours. And so here's one which will just retry any compile action that runs in CI, uh, because if you run into like, you know, you run out of memory, it's not actually a problem for most developers, and so just retrying it is, is usually fine. So we have like a retry tool. Um, <clears throat> the standard workflow for an engineer looks like this. You would uh, uh, invoke, uh, it with again, pure Python. You'd use a uh, build profile here, which is just kind of a wrapping of several arguments. So for example, dynamic build with debug off, something that many of you are probably familiar with. And this will generate a ninja file. And a ninja file just kind of keeps track of all the compiles that you actually have to run. And then we use Ninja to actually do our building. And the reason we use Ninja and not SCONS is because there's a lot of overhead of using SCONS. Uh, you have to deal with the global interpreter lock, uh, there's just generic Python overhead, and then SCONS was written 15 years ago, and so there's just improvements that have been made um, uh, since then. And so then we use Ninja, which has probably even, uh, ha has incredibly low uh, uh, compilation overhead, meaning that most of your time is spent doing compiles. So if you were to do a clean build, which is not common, without any remote execution, it takes about two hours. So naturally we need to do something better, and this is with uh, an eight-core computer. So most of our developers at MongoDB use Ice Cream, which is a uh, remote execution thing. I'm, at, I'm curious, who here has heard of Ice Cream? Wow, okay, I, I, I'm surprised by that number. Um, so Ice Cream allows you to execute actions remotely, execute compiles remotely, no remote linking, and no remote caching, at least by default. And so with eight cores and a J400 build, uh, it takes around 15 minutes. And this is, again, is building everything from scratch. This is less typical because most people will be running with one or two changes. Uh, J400 is a hard upper limit. 
Um, we find that ice cream maxes out between like two and 300 concurrent actions due to the uh, speed of the local system, uh, our network throughput, and some various other factors. So 400 gives us plenty of headroom. Um, so if we were to use J800, it would also be 15 minutes here. Um, oh, and then one other thing I need to mention about ice cream is it uses the uh, same machines that you are compiling on that your other team or people on your team are compiling on as well. So it is very possible that Zach and I are both running a compile at the same time. My actions go to his computer and his actions come to my computer. And so it doesn't really help much unless people, you know, there's a lot of uh, computers just sitting idle. And so that's a real bug we run into, which I'll talk about a little bit. Our CI, we don't use remote execution, but we do use remote caching. Um, and we run on a little bit beefier of a machine, and so we see with a 95 to 96% cache hit rate, which is very common for us, again, it takes about 15 minutes to run in CI. Um, but, and again, we don't do anything remotely here. And so the problems with this are uh, there's no distributed building in CI, as I talked about. Ice cream load balancing has a lot of bugs. There's no global cache. Local development is frequently polluted. Uh, and there's missing telemetry on local builds. Okay, joke's over. I'm actually gonna be talking about Bazel. So this is how we're gonna interoper interoperate Bazel and SCONS and how we could generalize this to other uh, build systems as well. <clears throat> Our purpose of this talk is to give SCONS repos the tools to migrate. So if you are one of the three people using SCONS in the audience and you wanna migrate, this, this is for you. You can take what we've done, you can control C, control V, you're good to go. Um, for those of you using something probably more mainstream, we think you can take a lot of the ideas out of this talk. So um, this is heavily inspired by this blog post, which I encourage you all to read, and this is gonna describe our migration approach. So um, this is a rewrite in general, but this is for a, uh, I've labeled the lines here for build system. So um, you can see, this access represents time of writing code. Features is very generic. This could be your library builds in Bazel or it builds in Scons, right? That's a feature, or maybe you have a debug build, right? That's a new feature. And at some point, you have enough features that your new build system, Bazel, is at parity with your old build system, Scons. And at that point, you're done. You know, you can pat yourself on the back, success. You can quit your job, no. Um, you, you know, you, you can feel good about what you've done at that point. There's this big zone here of no value being delivered. Um, when you're in this zone, nothing is improving on your existing build system, right? No features are being added to scons. And so this is a very naive approach, and this is what many people doing their first migration might think um, a migration looks like. So my question's for you. If you're seeing this and you're like, this is what I want to do, how big is the no value being delivered zone for you? Can you really calculate that? Are you sure that's right? Is your company, team, group, whatever, okay with the build system stagnating for that amount of time? Um, and are you absolutely sure no new features will be added? Are you absolutely sure this line is flat? I posit no, you are never sure. Um, if I look at my team's roadmap uh, over the past 12 months, um, I look at what we predicted versus what we did, there are always new features that we didn't plan for. And so this is what a realistic uh, migration looks like in that your existing build system is gonna to have to be maintained and improved during this whole migration. And so finding this point and predicting when you are actually done, much harder, because that involves predicting the future, right? Um, and yeah, so this is the new features required after migration starts. So this is much more realistic. This can work for certain companies, right? This approach, you just need to be sure that this area under the curve here is not that big. Um, and in my experience, uh, I've, I've done two of these basal migrations. This is much bigger than you think it is. I've done two of these migrations at like very large uh, C++ code bases. So we propose this being the correct approach to take for most build system migrations at a large scale. And so the no value being delivered zone here is much smaller. And what this zone represents is building the interoperability between your build system and Bazel. So for us, this is Sconce and Bazel. And then all the work here, you get incremental wins. So as you convert more features and more targets from Sconce to Bazel, your build slowly speeds up. 
gets more hermetic, gets more reliable, you have less bugs, and you can see the problems with your build uh, uh, kind of like decreasing at this time, or the, I shouldn't say it like that. The benefits of, get, uh, of being a basal build increase over this time. And so the, the pros of this approach are uh, functionality uh, only needs to be implemented in uh, one build system. So ideally, it's either being implemented in scones or it's being implemented in Bazel. There are some features that might need to be implemented in both, and for that, if you're at a large organization and some cowboy developer comes in and says, oh, I'm gonna code up this feature in only scones, they can't do that because it breaks the build, right? Because everybody at this point is using both build systems. The riskiest work here is done first. Um, you know, Bazel being in a sandbox, transitioning from a build system that is not in a sandbox, there might be things that we depend on that we just can't do anymore in Bazel. And by doing all this work first, we know that the migration can succeed. Shouldn't say that, it's far less risky. Um, the prediction of phases is much easier. So figuring out how long it's gonna to take to go from here to here, you can, get, you can predict that much better than from here to here. Or, uh, sorry, and then you can predict from here to here very well. Or you can predict, you can do two predictions <laughs> from here to here, and you can predict that pretty well, and then you can predict from here to here pretty well. And that's easier than going backwards and predicting the whole thing. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you get incremental wins. The one con of this, and what Zach's about to cover, is there's interoperable work, right? This all gets thrown away once you're done with the migration. So once you are pure Bazel, you lose all, all the work you've done here, it just gets thrown out. And that's part of, you know, that's, that's the win of this, right? That you're only on one build system in the end. So I'm gonna hand off to Zach to talk about the technical details here. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Zach. All right, so I'm going to be talking through the implementation overview of a hybrid build system. Uh, so Alex talked a lot about some of the underlying motivations as well as um, some of the organizational challenges uh, with a hybrid build uh, and some of the benefits of using it. I'm going to be mostly focusing on the hybrid layer itself, uh, so the ways in which, uh, in this case, uh, sconce interact with Bazel. All right, so the, the first thing is uh, we're going to want to keep sconce as a interface for developers to start with. Uh, the reason we want to do this is we don't want to change the uh, Bazel interface. Uh, if we inter introduce the Bazel interface to developers uh, at the start, it's probably going to change over time. Uh, we want to try to keep the uh, developer interface as uh, stable as possible to avoid any confusion as, we're, as the build system is evolving. Uh, so the first, one of the uh, first things we're going to want to implement is a mapping between uh, the CLI in Sconce and Bazel. Uh, so that's basically just mapping the of CLI flags in Sconce to uh, the CLI flags in Bazel, and that will hopefully uh, give us a good sense of how we want the final uh, command line interface to look. So um, what we're going to want to do then is we're going to want to call uh, Bazel build all uh, to compile all of the Bazel targets. Um, so the way we did this migration was um, a bottom up. Uh, so we start with the leaf nodes, uh, then work our way to the final uh, binary at the top. Uh, and uh, we actually had to uh, iterate a few times to figure out exactly what the optimal approach was here. Uh, we started with um, uh, trying out uh, having Sconce actually call uh, Bazel build on, on the certain targets that it, uh, we want it to build. Uh, we ended up uh, finding out that with remote execution and remote caching, it's usually better to just build everything um, and uh, rely on cache sets to, uh, to get everything uh, working. Uh, so we can then share the analysis cache. So um, after that, we, we need to set up the Bazel querying magic to figure out uh, any uh, pure Bazel targets that Sconce isn't aware of. And then uh, we need to kick off the Sconce target compilation after the Bazel build uh, finishes. Uh, so the Sconce targets are going to depend on the Bazel targets underneath. And then uh, finally, we need to construct the C++ link line uh, containing all of the sconce and Bazel targets. Uh, in C++, if we're doing a static link, which we want, we usually want to do for release builds for performance reasons, uh, we need a listing of the entire, uh, basically every target uh, that the binary transitively depends on. And again, the target conversion is done uh, bottom up, uh, starting with the leaf nodes, uh, as you can see here. Uh, so you can see that it's um, the, at the top we have MongoD. Uh, that's one of the three main uh, core binaries in the MongoDB uh, database engine code base. 
uh, and then you can see there are some sconce libraries underneath, uh, and then there are some, uh, a couple Bazel libraries on the left, uh, right at the bottom. Uh, so those are the, the bottom most nodes in this graph are the leaf nodes. Um, and we have around, uh, I believe it's around 1,200 total libraries in our graph, uh, so it gets pretty deep. Um, so yeah, so basically the way this conversion works is we'll start with the third party dependencies uh, and any other leaf nodes, and then we'll gradually work our way up to uh, the, the core binary. Uh, and there are some different trade-offs uh, to the order that you, you perform this conversion. Uh, so, so basically, um, uh, the different approaches you could use are, uh, one, you could do a, a top-down approach, uh, so you uh, start with MongoDB and work your way down, uh, or you could do a, a bi-directional approach, um, and uh, so uh, that way you can basically convert any target uh, in any order you want. Uh, and they each kind of have their own trade-offs. Um, the reason we went with bottom-up rather than uh, top-down is that uh, in C++ at least, uh, the link is, is fairly expensive, it's fairly uh, complicated to, uh, to get right. Uh, and when converting a, a graph as large as this, a lot of times it's hard to uh, parallelize the work between all of the developers on the team. Um, so it's, it's useful to be able to have some, some of our team work on converting libraries and then have uh, other members of the team work on uh, the link itself. Uh, if we went with a, a bottom-down approach uh, or a top-down approach, we would need to uh, start with the link first, which might take a while to get right. Uh, and then uh, we won't be able to work on any uh, target conversion in the meantime. All right, uh, as you can see, um, one of the key characteristics of uh, the directionality of the migration is that you can't actually convert a uh, target until all of its dependencies have been converted. Uh, so you can see uh, we're able to convert the, um, uh, that one uh, under uh, MongoD uh, after we've converted the bottom two uh, leaf nodes at the left. Uh, but if we were to try to convert the, um, the node uh, to the right of uh, MongoD, then uh, we would have to convert uh, the two dependencies below that, uh, which uh, is a little bit unfortunate because for anyone that's done one of these migrations, a lot of times we'll run into targets that are just very tricky to get right. Maybe they rely on some undefined behavior that slightly changes when uh, you do the migration. Uh, but um, if, you, if you're doing either a top-down or a bottom-up uh, migration, you'll, you will have to do it in that defined order and you won't be able to skip over uh, targets. All right, so this is uh, showing a uh, top-down migration. So as I mentioned, uh, you then start with the binary and work your way down to the leaf nodes. Um, so yeah, so this, uh, again, like the benefit of this approach is that you can kind of start with the linker if you want to, uh, to do like the harder work first, but um, you, you do have the trade-off of making it a little bit difficult to parallelize the work. And this one uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, so it, we spent like a little bit of time considering this. Uh, so um, a bidirectional integration would basically involve, um, sconce would have to know about all of the Bazel dependencies and Bazel would have to know about all of the sconce dependencies. Uh, so we'd have to create um, a two different, lay, uh, we'd have to create uh, two different integration points. Uh, so effectively we would be doubling the work of the, um, of the, the hybrid scaffolding, which would only be temporary for the duration of the migration. Uh, so, um, and because we have to support so many different uh, uh, operating systems, uh, so Mac OS, Linux, uh, Windows, um, the integration layer for each is, is different, um, so it's, it's a good amount of extra work to have to duplicate that. Um, and then the other downside to this is that um, if, you, uh, if you're doing a bidirectional migration, a lot of times you'll have, uh, you'll, you'll call into Bazel, then that will call into Sconce, and then that will call into Bazel, and you'll basically have to interleave the uh, actual build calls, uh, which is going to be a good bit less performant, uh, and so you might run into some issues there. Um, and you also might, you, you're not going to be able to benefit from stuff like the uh, analysis cache as much. Uh, and then, yeah, the benefits are that you, uh, you can skip over any targets that uh, end up being uh, very tricky to, uh, to convert. All right, so with that out of the way, uh, this is the uh, target def uh, these are the target definitions. On the left, uh, you'll see 
the sconce script definitions. Uh, so as Alex mentioned, those are basically the sconce equivalent of the Bazel uh, build files. Um, so here we have foobar that depends on foo, uh, that depends on bar. Um, so foobar is in, uh, the is in sconce, uh, but uh, foo and bar are in the Bazel build files. Um, and again, these are only defined once. Uh, we don't have uh, duplicate definitions uh, throughout um, both build systems um, to uh, make it easier for developers to maintain. And um, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so once uh, once we have that, uh, we will want to be able to do a a query that will um, basically tell us. Um, what are all of the targets that can be built in Bazel, and what is their resulting uh, output file? Uh, so you can see uh, towards the bottom, uh, the output we basically want is a dictionary uh, containing the uh, sconce uh, label uh, with a mapping to the Bazel label and the, uh, the output uh, file. And the way we'll get this is we'll use uh, a query, uh, and we'll just uh, target the actual uh, link command uh, in this case uh, for uh, dynamic links, uh, to get the, um, the location of the final output. So w even once we've uh, done the A query to figure out all of the, the Bazel dependencies, uh, we'll still need to uh, do one more thing, which is we will need to figure out all of the, um, the libraries in Bazel that uh, er, uh, yeah, in Bazel that don't have a, a direct mapping to libraries in sconce. Um, so, for example, if we're compiling a foobar, we need to know that we also need to link in bar uh, in the final link line. Um, and there, there's no way for sconce to know that uh, by, by default with this, the, the, uh, the system the way it's currently set up. Um, so in this, the way it's currently set up, it would only uh, know about foo. Uh, and then, uh, so yeah, so basically we need a way to figure out uh, bar as well. So uh, the initial uh, idea we had was, let's just do another set of a query calls. Let's uh, loop over all of the, um, the top-level Bazel uh, targets and then try to um, try call a query on them and uh, to get a full listing of all of the dependencies underneath. Uh, so unfortunately, this ends up taking quite a while, uh, and there end up being quite a lot of uh, top-level targets. Um, so at some points in our graph um, during the conversion, we would end up with more than 100 uh, total top-level uh, nodes. Um, and each of these uh, inquiry calls takes about a half second to a second and a half. Um, so that's going to add uh, well over a minute to the total, uh, to basically like every build uh, command, which is, uh, is not acceptable, especially for, um, uh, for uh, like uh, a highly cached uh, build. So we need another way to build the graph without a query. So um, the way we came up with, and this was uh, an idea by one of our engineers, uh, Dan Moody, was um, it's an optimization that effectively uses the, um, uh, the analysis that Bazel's already done, because Bazel already knows internally all of the, the entire graph, right? Um, so basically, we just need a way to output that knowledge that Bazel has over to uh, sconce. Um, so what we can do here is we can actually just look at the linker context uh, and then loop over all of the linker inputs, uh, add them to a list, and then uh, output that to a file. Uh, and that will be pretty easy for uh, sconce to then take in and read. And more or less, that's, the, um, that's at least like the interesting bits of the integration layer. Um, there, there are definitely some other things that you, you need to, uh, to tweak to get working uh, for, uh, for a hybrid build, but uh, that uh, more or less covers uh, the graph uh, portion of it. All right, and then I want to uh, mention that all of our code is uh, fully open source, or at least for this migration. Uh, so if you want to see exactly how this hybrid build looks uh, for yourself, it's on github.com slash mongodb slash mongo. Um, and I want to uh, do a special thanks to the uh, MongoDB build team members, uh, and then also mention that our team is currently hiring for a senior software engineer position. Uh, this is fully remote across North America. Uh, you can uh, check our, our LinkedIn page uh, for info on that. All right.